My name is Christina Andres, and um, I wanted to take a moment to thank Robert Crouch and everyone from Pasadena Arts Council. This is a really exciting symposium to be part of, and I feel like I'm in such incredible company today and feel really excited to learn about so many projects and thoughts circulating in this, in this room. Um, so today I'm going to share some images from a project I founded that's called Knowledges. Um, we recently presented an exhibit, a site-specific art exhibit at Mount Wilson Observatory. Um, but first I'm going to take a few minutes to introduce myself and my background um, to give a little context to how, how Knowledges came about and how I approach it as an artist-led project. Um, so just to give a background, like I have a, a lifelong love of stargazing and probably attributable to growing up in rural Ohio. Uh, you know, where many quiet late nights were spent looking skyward. And I remember setting up my first telescope when Halley's Comet passed in 1986, a few memorable uh, family trips to a local observatory, and even an unusual summer when the Aurora Borealis reached south enough to see from our yard. Um, I think these early experiences kindled a closeness to the night sky and an ongoing interest in its mysteries. Um, now I'm a visual artist and I work mostly in painting and drawing. And my artwork explores vocabularies of the ineffable in science, art, and mysticism. And although these three disciplines contrast in very distinct ways, I'm interested where they intersect on the threshold of the unknown. And that's an ongoing theme through all of my projects. Um, all my projects draw upon this innate human search for cosmic origins, considering both the archaic and contemporary. Much of my recent 2D work has focused on text, both as linguistic content and visual form, like this series I'm going to show. A couple images, these are paintings called All Encompassing. Um, this one reads, an overarching view of the universe and the cosmic position of the human being. Um, this one is a comprehensive conceptual structure that, takes that makes intelligible the complexities of human experience. And this one is where remote futures meet remote pasts. Uh, these works employ systems that transform phrases and diagrams into an exploration of mantra and pattern. These are graphite on dense matte black surfaces. So in person, there's an interplay of light and shadow that formally echoes a process of revelation and obfuscation. Um, I also often explore a liminal space between the rational and the irrational. Um, using the diagrammatic, this is actually a pattern ba um, based on the first uh, speed of light test. It's called on the relative motion of the earth and the luminiferous e ether. Um, so this was actually the test that disproved the existence of the mysterious and long speculated existence of ether. Um, and then this is a still from a performance that I did called In the Shadow of the Invisible that used the spiritual dance form Eurythmy to shape words and sounds into movements and cosmic patterns. So a lot of my work conflates these different practices sort of in a search for understanding their common crossover of languages that explore the unknown. Um, and the last project I'm going to show of mine is um, that perhaps was most informative to beginning knowledges as a curatorial project um, was a visit that I made to a site in Karnak in France. Um, and this is um, a Neolithic archaeoastronomy site. Um, it dates back to around 3,000 years BC. And these monuments, uh, these megalithic monuments, uh, vary in size from about knee high all the way up to about 30 feet old, 30 foot tall. Uh, monuments and they align with the and these unusual processions that align with the setting sun on the winter solstice. And this region in France actually has the largest concentration of these megaliths um, in Europe. Um, and after visiting this site, I was really astounded by how ancient cultures create monuments to mark the passage of the sun, the moon, and the planets. And I came to understand this impulse as a timeless experience that perme permeates humanity. And it's really lingered with me as an artist. So after this project, I began thinking a lot about how space impact, place impacts our understandings of cosmological space. 
that it's not just a project, a process of looking outward, but also one of looking inward and knowing where we are rooted and how that informs our perspective. And this was really key for me in developing Knowledges. So Knowledges is a, an artist-led curatorial initiative um, that we've presented twice now at Mount Wilson Observatory. And when I first visited Mount Wilson Observatory, I immediately knew I wanted to do an art show there. Um, it's an amazing place where the spirit of discovery feels palpable. So I'm going to give a little background on the site. Um, and uh, Mount Wilson Observatory is located in the San Gabriel Mountains, uh, right here, about one mile above Los Angeles. You can see this pretty much from anywhere in the city. These are the tall structures are the solar observation towers. Um, it was founded in 1904 by George Ellery Hale, and the site was chosen for its unusually steady atmospheric conditions. It's famous as a, uh, this is a picture showing where you're actually above the clouds. They call it the inversion layer, which is the atmospheric condition that keeps the cloud cover and the smog down in LA, but it keeps the skies very clear up above. Um, um, it is famous as a locus for major cosmological discoveries of the early, early 20th century that include the early detection of the sun's magne magnetism, the first speed of light tests by Albert Michelson, Harlow Shapley's measurement of the size of the Milky Way galaxy, which located our position in it far from the center, as previously thought. Uh, Edwin Hubble's proof that spiral nebulae were in fact distant galaxies similar to our own. And most famously, Hubble's discovery that the universe is expanding, which laid the support for the Big Bang Theory. Um, this is another view of the 100-inch telescope where Hubble did his research. Um, Mount Wilson houses two large telescopes, the 60-inch telescope and the 100-inch telescope, um, which was the largest in the world for over 30 years, and it's actually celebrating its centennial this fall. Um, and this is actually an aerial view of the observatory that was taken um, by the Center for Land Use Interpretation, actually from our 2012 <coughs> exhibition, and they call it Observing the Observatory. So we're actually looking over, they actually flew a weather balloon, so we're looking down on the 100-inch telescope, the 60-inch telescope. You can see the solar towers in the background. Um, and then I'm going to just start about, so um, our primary focus of knowledge is, is to examine sites that raise existential questions. Our first two major projects have examined Mount Wilson Observatory as a nexus of creative inspiration. And what we do as a tiny artist-run organization is facilitate tours for artists to connect with the ex and experience the site, gather research, and produce a site-specific exhibition and small publication. Um, working closely at the intersection of site and observation, we ask, how can art under open new understandings of place? So we had our, we were founded, I founded Knowledges in 2011, and our first exhibition at Mount Wilson was in 2012, and that show was completely unprecedented and included over four, about 40 artists in the, and um, in the interest of time today, I'm not going to present work from that show, but I'll invite you to visit our website. We have a lot of documentation up there. Um, you can see we have projects from Lita Albuquerque and Katie Grinnan, and just the, like an amazing, group of artists that came together. Today I'm going to focus on our most recent show, which took place last month, June 3rd and 4th. And this 2017 exhibition was made possible with support of a grant from the Mike Kelly Foundation for the Arts, which really opened up a lot of new possibilities for us and the artists. It featured 10 core visual artists who were commissioned to create new works for the show. Um, and in addition to that, then we assembled an advisory committee, which included John Hogan, Ian James, Gabby Strong, Rika Wilcox, and myself. And together, we put together the rest of the exhibition, including uh, music and performance um, lectures and uh, <laughs> over 16 hours of programming each day. <laughs> so I'm still a little recovering. Um, and so this, this work I'm going to start with is Alice Konitz and um, sort of drawing on the 
you know, the ancient to modern one. She did, she had two facets to her project. And this one, the first were, these are actually, she had three of these natural obsidian discs, which were inspired by a trip she did to Chichen Itza some years ago, where she realized, or first experienced that local people traditionally use obsidian to view eclipses <coughs> and look at the sun um, in, in their older art forms. So she, had these discs cut and this custom hardware made. So they were actually positioned in three locations so the viewers could look at the sun from specific locations at specific times. Um, there's another image of that. And then her other project was she created this solar tent, which it was a welded steel structure with canvas and the solar tent material um, used in the aerospace industry. So you could actually go and recline in this and look through the sun, or look at the sun, through it at the sun. Um, and she would reposition it periodically throughout the day. So it, it was the project really beautifully, you know, drew from this history that Mount Wilson has. It's just most famous for some of its cosmological discoveries, but really it also um, it, it's really famous too for a lot of its solar observation that goes on there. It's the solar tower, the 150 foot solar tower, which I'll show some more images of in a minute. Uh, people have been making hand drawn images of the sun in some spots there for over 100 years, and they have an extensive archive of all those images. This is that little orange dot, <laughs> is the sun through the solar tent. Um, so this is actually looking up at the 150-foot solar tower. And in the base of this, um, Channing Hansen installed a site-specific work. This is actually installed on the ceiling in the base of the solar tower. It's a, a textile work that he, um, he wove together specifically for the space. And it's inspired by the collection of the data from the solar tower, and they use what the scientists call this false coloring, you know, that basically um, allows them to visually interpret data in new ways. So that inspired part of his palette choice for the work. Um, and so it was kind of an interesting installation when you would go into this space that you would also, you'd look up, and then in the center of the room, there's a, the aperture for where there's a live image of the sun projected on the table where they actually do the solar drawings, every, the sunspot drawings every day. This is another view. And this was all hand woven, he hand dyed and uh, spun the, the wool himself. This is Kristen Cunningham's installation. Um, she named it Pegasus, and it was actually a series of four hand-knit hammocks that were strung in a, a square configuration between four trees. And the piece was really beautifully wove together, this idea she was interested in between the, the terrestrial and the celestial, and creating a space of contemplation between the two. So you, people could come and relax in the hammocks all day and, um, and, and just look up for, during the daytime and relax. And then they really were activated. A lot of the artists, this project in particular, also thought about the transition from day to night. So the, the exhibition only ran June 3rd and 4th, but June 3rd it was 10 a.m. until 1 a.m on Saturday, and then Sunday it was 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. So there was this broad window of time and the passage of light, so a lot of projects really looked into this. Um, so she actually uh, installed uh, black, black lights on each of the trees, so the hammocks were radiant at night, and it was really surreal to lay in them and, you know, see the glowing, be, be held in the net of glowing fabric while, you know, the black light sort of cancels out your skin. <laughs> and then you look up at the stars and see shooting stars. So it was a really beautiful installation. And she had another part of her project, which she calls the Human Loom. This is an interactive piece, which is basically 
these large um, elastic bands that are interactive that people loop together in different configurations that she leads them through a series of exercises and sort of almost like trust building more therapy <laughs> that people have to like work together to figure out um, and measure their body and weight and tension. Um, so this was something that was going on all weekend that people could interact with. This is a work by Gregory Michael Hernandez called Architecture of Time. He had three parts to his project, and this is mahogany wood um, that he had uh, installed, and I think it's about, mm, I guess it would be around like 50 inches or so um, in diameter. And again, you can see this transition from night, from day to night that took place in the installation. He was really interested in this idea of the advancements that we've seen in 20th century um, knowledge in science and philosophy, and also the limits we have in perceiving it in time and space. Um, so these sculptures were his attempts to delve into that. This is a, he actually took a series of uh, panoramic photos inside the 60 inch telescope and then sculpted them. Um, into this photographic shape that mimics the other one. And there it is again at nighttime. Um, here we're looking at the facade of the Astronomical Museum, which is one of the few buildings that's always open to the public up there. It's really a lovely building inside. It has a series of backlit um, images taken at the observatory. I assume many people here have visited Griffith, Griffith Observatory, which has some of the same images um, and similar display methods because they were uh, built around the same time. Um, but this project is featuring Eric Frydenborg's sculpture. So these two sculptures flanking the entrance aren't normally there. Um, but he was really inspired in thinking about the museum as, um, he called it like an oracular shrine. Um, so he created these two large scale sculptures that he was thinking of as sentinels that guard it. And this um, reflective mirror is always in the center is always present on there, basically as a safety mirror because it's around the corner on a very small road. Um, but he used that as an element in both of his sculptures, too. And then it also took on a dramatic presence um, with At Night, where the underlighting really created these dramatic shadows, and it really did feel like this, the, st the statues were guarding <laughs> the space. There's another detail of it. And they just rose up the building. This is a detail of a single side. And then inside the museum, we had, we had a number of events going on inside. Um, most of the days we were screening, this is a video work by Jeff Kane called Blind Spot, which unfortunately I don't have much more documentation to show right now uh, today, but this was a really stunning video that where he actually compiled that one, what the 100 years of solar drawings that um, have been recorded at the solar tower. Um, he actually, they've been digitized and he downloaded them all and like basically animated the 100 years of the solar drawings and then overlaid it with a video that he took from a camera mounted on a, a robot that basically did a 360 and then 180 view of the forest. And he actually, um, he made them interact like through a program or soft, somehow he, like, <laughs> he, through editing. So basically like the effect of the film, the result is that like as the, the drawings speed up and move and you see the sunspots moving throughout the years, that it actually begins to warp the image that you're seeing of the surrounding forest. So it was really, it's really a beautiful piece where, it, I mean, I had the sensation watching it that I almost felt like I was seeing what, like through the eyes of sunlight, what it feels like to, um, to be absorbed into the forest. But we also had some other programming going on in the theater. We showed a series of lantern slides from the Carnegie Archive. 
um, that were actually uh, based on plates that were taken at the, uh, through the telescopes, most of them about 100 years old. Um, so that was exciting. Um, this is a sculpture by Karen Lofgren, Trace Elements, which used, the idea was that they um, bring together, they comprise the, they're made of just the materials that the human body um, is also made of. This is a sculpture by Rosha Yagmai, which is her moon bench and um, lamps. So again, the transition from day to night. It's a detail. Um, this is Margaret Wertheim gave a, a symposium on the idea of making space at Mount Wilson Observatory, and we talked about um, the changing ideas of space. And then she led an interactive workshop where people were able to create models of hyperbolic space using paper. And then this is the 100 inch telescope again. And in here, Scott Benzel presented his, um, a performance that was for movement, performance and sound piece for string quartet, anvil, dancers, and telescope operator. Mm -hmm. And it was performed on the rotating deck inside the telescope. So basically, the telescope itself stays stationary. I mean, it pivots, but the dome, the building structure rotates around it. So he used that as an element in his performance called Mathesis and Mathematicoi. Um, so it dramatically began with the dome being closed, and then he struck an anvil, and then it opened. <laughs> and so then the shifting light as the dome rotated was also an element in the performance. And the dance was inspired by the style of the Judson School. Um, so very contemporary. And there were actually points where the dancers interacted with the rotating uh, dome. There's an unusual sensation when you sit in the space and the dome rotates that you, it definitely feels like the telescope is rotating, not the platform you're sitting on. So the dance also pulled into that um, sort of confusion, you know, whether you were moving or the space was. And the, the dancers sometimes pulled and dragged themselves against the rotating. Sometimes they moonwalked and, and appeared to be standing still when they were actually um, traveling backwards. So it was a really beautiful piece, and he performed it three times each day. And we had, so those were the 10 featured artist projects. And then we also had additional programming. Um, this was an artist edition that we commissioned Claire Noreen for. It's a series of newly imagined constellations um, that, take, that she envisioned it, surrounding Cygnus the Swan, and these were actually constellations that were overhead and visible during knowledges. Um, so these are her plant-based new constellations. And then as the sun set, this is a view, you can see how dramatic and beautiful it is on a clear night up there looking out. We had a series of other free performances, a gong ceremony by Hari Sant. These were planetary gongs tuned to different frequencies. And in both the large telescopes, we had a series of sound performances that were paired with viewing sessions through the telescopes. So um, this is Tara Jane O'Neill performing. You can see someone looking through the telescope. That was during one of the moon viewing sessions. And thematically for these sessions, curating them, we thought a lot about this idea of inner and outer space exploration. So the musicians we, um, we invited to play, you know, um, ha, um, were sort of exploratory, made psychedelic or, or space feeling music. Um, one of, and that was an important aspect of understanding the thing. This is a performance by Ana Luisa Patrisco, um, also known as Jeep Muse. And she likes a lot of her performances, sound and multimedia, and she's sort of also exploring this convergence of the ancient and the futuristic. 
And this took place outside the 100-inch telescope. like when the telescope's open with the red lights inside for viewing. And we had two performances by Constance Demby, who uh, were pretty rare for her to come out and play. This is a, an instrument she created called the Space Bass, which is actually a series of <coughs> tuning rods that she bows. And then it also has this torch sheet of steel that can be drummed percussively, and it creates a really vibratory um, hypnotic and uh, very immersive sound. So it was a unique pairing to, to hear this and have the, you know, the resonant space of the telescopes filled with these sounds. And this is, uh, this is actually one of the slides from Carnegie that gives you an idea. This is a view of the surface of the moon. So this is what one might be looking at when you're listening to Constance Demby. <laughs> and um, these are also images. The left is the nebula from the 60-inch telescope and the right image is the same one from the 100-inch to give you an idea of the views from the telescopes. And yes, that's my main presentation. There's a lot. <laughs>